Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy, and here I am sitting on the porch using my tripod because today I'm going to need both my hands so I don't appear to be faffing around as I have to refer to some notes. It is the 17th of August 2024 as I record this and um, from what I can see the more I look into it the more um, the UK looks like an absolute shit show and I'm just so glad I'm not there man. I mean really seriously glad I'm not there. I don't really want to return man. Absolutely bloody not. So I've got to go through a whole bunch of notes here and um, let's see where we start. So get to my bullet points, very important here. Right, and where I want to start is I want to start with um, a poem that was read out by a certain Emma Lucy Shaw, who of course I remember meeting in one of the breaking convention conferences back in the day. I think it was in Greenwich or something like that. Um, so uh, without any further ado, I shall get on and play this because I found this very inspiring. I see your rituals upon my aisle, I see the spells you cast, I see your towers of corruption, and I see how you control the mass. But Sherwood Forest still dwells in my soul, and merry men of resistance. And I see any queen sings to my spirit, and Saxon kings of vengeance. A red dragon and a white, the wild seafarers of the north. It lay dormant for a while, but we are remembering our worth. For many have been made to hate us, the crimes of sellout lords, who created banks of England, funded by a tribal foreign law. That's magic is dark and old, massacring the ancient ways, replacing it with their own to subdue us in many ways. It's been so long since we tasted freedom, we forgot we were enslaved, obeying an abusive system that is replacing us each day. But despite the lies that displaced me from this land, for I know I was born where my ancestors did stand, and everything that was built through the sweat and blood of bygone days, it is ours for the keeping and not for you to give away. Now I thought that was great, you know, because yet yeah, it, it just basically captures my imagination. You know, we are the ancients of those islands. Now, of course, she's, um, what to say, an ancient from Albion. She's um, English, and of course me, I'm from the neighboring island. I'm an uh, ancient uh, Hibernian, but of course born in England too. And it does seem to me really, really unfortunate to see that the UK has got into the state that it is in right now, is it not? I mean, unfortunate is a deep, deep understatement. And it's good, you know, that uh, people are speaking out and using, you know, anything from metaphor to poetry to art to satire, anything you can do, you know. There's obviously certain pitfalls and we know what they are now. Or at least we hope we know what they are now and they don't move the goalposts, you see. It's a very uncertain time right now. But I would not be able to live with myself if I just shut up and run away and just disappeared and didn't make these videos anymore. Would you? Well, a lot of people have done, gone silent. And, um, you know, when the initial fear wait and wears off, we can only hope that they come back and they'd be very mindful about how they talk about it, right? So, yeah, this is the thing. Not only um, are we ancients of these sacred isles, I kind of also think that we are Lord of the Rings characters. I look at Emma and she looks to me like um, sort of a, uh, a shield maiden of Rohan. And um, well, you can tell I'm um, a Rivendell elf myself. So there you go. And it's funny how a lot of the people who look like um, they have that uh, spirit of the ancients do actually look like Lord of the Rings characters and even have the character of the types of people that they are too. Right? So um, what I was going to elaborate on is to say that back in the day um, when I used to go to these um, breaking convention uh, conferences, as when I used to go to the side trance parties, as when I was in all of the old, uh, we call it uh, alternative scenes, I kind of started to notice a bit of a schism. I started to notice there were some people around, especially in the uh, third breaking convention one I went to, and I can't remember what year it was. It might have been 10 years ago, it might have been eight years ago, I can't actually remember, but it was a while back. And I remember thinking that there was something not quite right about these new people who were turning up there. There was a lot of people who seemed to be indoctrinated into what um, would eventually metastasize into what we now know as woke ideology. I could see the beginnings of it. Now, it manifested itself as third wave feminism. It was very clear that there was something, you know, not quite right about this, right? And um, we see now it's gone from then on. 
And what I kind of notice is that, um, that yeah, the people who went who were in academia and the people that are in the middle class seem to have been swept one way, and the people who are more from a working class background seem to have been swept another way. Right? A chasm um, has come into our fragmented alternative scene that we can no longer unite on. It's gone. It seems to me as well. And it's not just happened in the normie world, right? And this is one of the things. And I kind of think that, like, yeah, me, just like Emma, just like maybe a few other people, we ended up being, you know, forced onto one side. And the people that um, really care about and are concerned about the state of the UK at the moment and the direction that it's going in, who are not celebrating all rainbows and unicorns in some sort of delusion of utopia, shall we say, <clears throat> there is a definitely a huge um, chasm between that. But um, as I say, you know, um, one of the things that I do want to um, talk about before I get on to my next subjects is the fact that I have been purging ideological malware out of myself. You see, as I say, back in the day, I was never really all into those red lefties, never, you know, not at any point in my life. I knew who the far right were back in the 80s because I confronted a few of them and it was extremely terrifying see my last video. And um, I know now that they don't have the political power or the influence, you know, or the backing that they had back then. So when um, they talk about this far-right bogeyman now, it's like, it's like they don't know history, they don't understand politics, they don't understand any of it. This is just a kind of um, low-resolution dunce um, psyop which is going on at the moment. And the fact is that despite the fact that, yeah, during those recent riots, there really were a few clear hooligan thugs there that really wanted to, you know, throw bricks and, you know, give police a good kicking in and just be violent and smash things. Right? Yes, we know there were plenty of them, you know, and obviously I would say to people, don't do it, it ain't big and it ain't clever. Despite that, you get the impression from Keir Starmer that he's written off the entire working class of the British Isles, entirely written them off and say, they're not protests, this is just far-right thuggery. There's plenty of evidence of legitimate protests that went on that they have ignored, and they've only focused on the thugs. And so the, the spin coverage, in my opinion, appears inaccurate, you know? And, you know, don't get me started on the two-tier thing, or maybe it's a three-tier thing. I really don't know at this point. It's a multi-tier thing, but it's certainly not, um, you know, proportionate and even not at all, right? So, the removal of any ideological malware that I kind of felt that I was infected by, that might have been on what I would consider to be the soft left of old counterculture, um, did actually alienate me and put me on one side of a chasm that I didn't expect to see coming. Now, this I uh, became very noticeable when I voted Brexit. The reason why it was noticeable because I got a lot of abuse on Facebook. I lost a lot of friends. Well, they obviously weren't my friends in the first place. If that's all it took, uh, my, my taste in democracy for them was not right, so therefore they had um, to lose me as their friends, not just have a debate with me or ask me. and We could, we could have a conversation, but no, it didn't come to that at all. And when I voted uh, Brexit, um, there was no... Um, my version, my reasoning, and my understanding of politics was not mentioned in any way at all. You see, all they spoke about was they were stupid, gammon, non-university educated, racist little Englanders were voting for Brexit. And there was these enlightened metropolitan, um, you know, was it internationalists um, who voted to stay in the European Union. My reasoning that you wouldn't have heard anywhere was in the post-war era of supranational organisations, if I get a chance in a referendum to vote for us to leave any of these supranationalist, uh, globalist, international bodies, sort of bureaucratic bodies, I would vote to leave any of them. I would vote to leave the UN, the IMF, the World Bank, the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, and I would make sure I would to vote for people who said that they would expel anyone who was a member of the World Economic Forum in their political party. Right? Just purely as a, a decentralisation, small, more localised government, because in the aftermath of the Second World War, and especially in the aftermath of the First World War, to me, supranational organisations are just kind of like the modern day equivalent of empires. And that's why I would uh, take any opportunity to vote to leave them. You know, maybe it's an independence from, you know, uh, we call it uh, autonomy from, you know. 
smaller governments, smaller institutions. Definitely not. You know, top heavy, overly bureaucratic organisations because we know where they lead and they are leading there now. That's the reason why I voted. But unfortunately, I find myself in a situation now where I couldn't really go back and meet those people who well, would have known 10 or 20 years ago and have conversations with them because they tell me I was far right. And this is just utterly ridiculous. They obviously, just like Keir Starmer, know nothing about politics. And again, you know, what sort of people are running the world at the moment? I just think we're dealing with dunces. I mean, you know, as I said about Keir Starmer, if he wants to get a broad brush and paint half of the UK as far right, you know, um, then he knows nothing about politics. Just like he doesn't, him and David Lammy don't seem to know much about biology, right? I'm not sure I want to elaborate or go much into there, but uh, this is a picture of Keir Starmer and David Lammy being dunces, right? Just the thing. I feel that, the, you know, tyranny coming is one thing, but having my intelligence insulted is another, right? Anyway, I want to introduce people to the concept of malicious compliance. You shouldn't just repeat slogans. Don't matter what side you're on, there's a slogan going around saying you can't comply your way out of tyranny. Now, these people who say that um, have just uh, become very inflexible. This is a slogan, I'm repeating it. We can't have any NPCs watching my channel. Um, I want to introduce you to the concept of malicious compliance. Now, according to my notes, if I just have a butcher's ear, it says, and I got this from Wikipedia, <laughs> so it must be true. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, you know, my idea is to comply in a certain ways that I will use sources that they approve of and, um, and follow them to the letter in order to point out the holes in their narrative. I mean, I have complied, you know, <laughs> so there you go. Malicious compliance, it says here. Malicious compliance is the behaviour of strictly following the orders of a superior, despite knowing that compliance with the orders will have an unintended or negative result. It usually implies following an order in such a way that ignores or otherwise undermines the order's intent, but follows it to the letter. And then it says Wikipedia on the end, so there you go, you know. Yes, yeah, so how can this malicious compliance be used, you might be wondering. Well, I don't want to go and say, oh, I'm glad you asked, because that reminds me of all those Muppets that uh, you see on TikTok. They always say that, don't they? I, I didn't even hear whether you asked or not. You know, there you go. Right. So, back to my original notes. Um, I'm trying to make it a bit less faffy than I was doing it. Right. I'll give you a, a good idea. Right. Now, there was some terrible propaganda recently, weren't there? I mean, um, and in order to uh, get a source, in order to explain this terrible propaganda, what better way to comply to the establishment it, than to get a maverick peer of the realm to explain it. Yes, Baroness Fox of Buckley, better known um, to, informally as Claire Fox. Listen to what she has to say in this recent podcast interview. People were absolutely terrified. We were told this far-right mobs were descending up from all around the country. People were staying inside. You couldn't go to the doctor. Your hospital appointments were cancelled. What then happened was anti-racist counter-demonstrations came out in big numbers in certain places. No one from this far-right organisations or nobody who they could even label far-right did turn up. Now we live in a world of peace and harmony, if you read the headline. Oh, isn't this fantastic? The decent people of one all these kind of lunatic fringe groups are sidelined. They've also admitted the list of 100 demonstrations was probably a hoax. Hope not hate circulated what is now admitted to be a hoax list, terrified the nation into thinking that there was about to be riots everywhere. Point about this notion of two-tier policing has broadened out now to two-tier governance. You can lie on social media and no one is going to come down to arrest the hope not hate guys. Yes, it appears that um, Hope Not Hate um, actually put out quite a lot of misinformation that actually led to consequences that were actually quite bad and um, got away with it without prison time, without any of these things. There's the thing, you know, it's funny how there's one rule for them. If you're trying to convince me that there is no two-tier governance in the UK, you're doing a terrible job of it, right? So, yeah, this is true. Um, you know, they uh, decided to, uh, what was it, uh, they said it was a hoax. I don't actually know who organised the hoax. I'm not actually sure myself, but they confirmed that the um, that the call out for these, I don't know whether it was something like 30 to 100 far right riots that was supposed to be happening that never happened, was a hoax. 
And it was good for them because it got them the right newspaper headline. So, you know, as a result of that, um, it was terribly done. It was like a psyop for dunces, basically, again. And um, as a result of uh, this, they did, I can imagine I was in the Cobra meeting with them. And they're all sitting there thinking, hmm, how can we stop these riots? Oh, how can we do good spin coverage? Oh, I'll phone my mate Nick. He can, uh, and we can arrange for these telegram channels. We can pretend they're the far right. And then we can announce that there's going to be 30 far right protests around the country. And then we can get our friends at um, Stand Up to Racism and Socialist Worker to mass produce all of these banners that all look the same. And we can get our useful idiots and uh, lefties uh, to, for a minute, to put down their avocado uh, on toast and, and stop, you know, and their kombucha just for a minute. And they can all come out, hold these banners, and we have the perfect photo opportunity to say that the anti-racists -racist, have smashed the fash. And so, um, this is what uh, they were doing, and it went all over for all the low IQ normies to see. And then that was the end of it. Yeah, we saved the world. It's all rainbows and unicorns now. So, here is a picture of those fine upstanding citizens all smashing the fash. There you can see them, all, um, so many of them, and, uh, and there they are. And, uh, and on the other side, you can see the far right. Oh, where are they? I can see one bloke in the distance. Is he far right? Oh, there's a car there. Well, probably a few far right thugs in that car. Oh no, wait a second, can you hear that? Oh, can you see that? Oh my God, the far right seem to have nicked Doctor Who's TARDIS and they're arriving in it. You know, it's bigger on the inside. There might be hundreds of millions of them in there. Oh, and they, they've now got into galactic backup from the Time Lords of Gallifrey. Oh no, we're done for. My oh God, what a formidable foe we have. Oh, bloody hell, eh? Oh well, <laughs> there you go. So this is just really intelligence insulting spin coverage at this point, is it not? I mean, you know, I find it really, really difficult to take them seriously. And I find, you know, my intelligence feels like it's so insulted and, you know, they're, they're it's just, you know, that's the thing. I mean, you know, I feel more that my intelligence is being insulted and really held in contempt by that than I do scared of a tyranny at this point. Don't know about you, you know? So, yeah, this is the thing. And also, um, something else I want to play as well is that they don't like us talking about the two-tier policing system. And um, this is a clip from the New Culture Forum. And this is... Um, Excuse the dogs in the background. I only hope that my microphone is picking up me f louder than it's picking up the dogs. This is a bloody hazard of me living in the Philippines. It's a bloody noisy place, right? But anyway, what I was saying. This is a clip of a Harrison Pitt talking on uh, one of the uh, new Culture Forum programs. And this is what he had to say about Mark Rowley in relation to two-tier policing. And we also saw Sir Mark Rowley yesterday hint, semi-suggesting that um, uh, in actual fact people who describe the police as engaging in two-tier policing could themselves be guilty of legitimizing violence against the police. And that, what is that if not a Mickey Mouse way of saying that these people would themselves be guilty of incitement of violence? I've called the police, um, I, I've accused the police of two-tier policing, I suspect you have, I know Connor has. Does that mean that we're answerable to that? And the, that would, then that would put the police above reproach, which is the second element of being a police state. So I don't think it's hyper hyperbole to say that at this point. Now that is actually quite alarming, isn't it? He's hinting at that if anyone suggests that maybe two-tier policing is real, they're saying that we're sort of justifying, um, what is it, violence against the police? Well, firstly, I've got to make sure that no, I personally am not. You know, despite the police often being referred to as order followers, the truth of the matter is that they often don't have the power to not without risking losing their jobs and all of the rest of it. And, you know, uh, that's really one of the issues, is that it's the government, it's the think tanks, it's the quangos, it's the shadowy organisations, and it's the, uh, it's usually the, the only police that the issue, the, the top brass, isn't it? You know, that's the, the thing. They just go and they're told what to do, and um, they could just become persona non grata if they have any problem with it. And as a result of it, when um, the overwhelming evidence that we've seen with our own eyes to say that one group of people have been treated differently to another group of people has actually made a lot of people think, well, I can see um, with my own eyes that it's very likely that the, that the two tier policing exists. Are they telling us, and they're telling us that it hasn't, they keep denying it. Again, I feel like my intelligence is being insulted and, um, well, you know, as I say, if they can't convince me that there isn't two-tier policing, and I'm saying that, 
and it's making uh, it's making Harrison Pitt nervous, and it's making uh, Connor Tomlinson nervous. Then uh, does that mean uh, I'm going to be extradited? Oh God, let me see. Sorry, everyone. I couldn't resist that. That's a, that's a Terry Gilliam animation, there, as you can see, that I sort of uh, modified from Monty Python's Flying Circus. That's them coming to get me, eh? Yep. <laughs> I thought, well, why not? You might as well just, you know, satire. Again, satire and malicious compliance. My two weapons of, uh, of a war. I'm ooh, not fighting because I'm complying, remember? There you go, right? So, it makes me want to dig even deeper into all of this because, again, who am I to comply to if I'm maliciously complying? Am I to comply to the Labour Party in government now or am I to comply to the Labour government in power 20 years ago? Because we haven't apparently had regime change in those 20 years, have we? No, we haven't, right? And if you go back to the time of 9-11 uh, and the invasion of Iraq, right, what happens then is that we have um, Tony Blair telling us that the, uh, you know, the, these Islamic terrorists um, are a threat to us, they're the bogeyman, and that uh, they, are, they hate our freedoms, they hate our way of life. Of course, they were still taking our freedoms away from us back then. But this is what they said, these were the bogeyman. Now, this was the government, this was the Labour government saying that, not some tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist, no. And now we're being told that it's the far right, the entire English working classes, while they appease the previous bogeyman. So which um, government, which parliament am I supposed to follow? Do I comply to what they say now or do I comply to what they say in the past? What they said in the past seems to have more elements of truth in it than um, what they are saying now. So, you know, this is a bit where I'm confused. And the other question I want to ask is that anyone who might still be in the Labour Party who may have been involved in it um, 20 years ago, are they now, um, what say, members of the far right for spouting out the Labour Party line that they did 20 years ago? Or is that going to be now memory hold? Because this is one of the things that I would really, really would like to know. And again, I would like to go even deeper into this as well. Because if you were to go back um, to 9-11, now, a lot of people believe different things about 9-11, and I wish to basically conduct a thought experiment here. A lot of people think that 9-11 was an inside job. There's a lot of the normie people out there that believe hook, line and sinker, the official version of 9-11. Now what I would like to do is be agnostic, not take any position, but use the thought experiment of supposing, for those of you who believe it was an inside job, I'll ask you to play Let's Pretend, right, for a minute. Suppose that the official story was true and what they were telling us was true while they were telling us that this bogeyman back then hates us for our way of life. Suppose it was true. The official story suggests to us that um, under the instruction of Osama bin Laden, Mohammed Atta and his mates decided to use two jets as basically suicide vests that were too big to put on. That's the, what the official story tells us. Right. Now, how did that happen? What was the source of that happening? It goes back to 1981, when the Ayatollah Khomeini um, uh, basically uh, decided to reinterpret the Quran um, in Iran. Now, I'm going to cut over to a little clip from uh, Adam Curtis's hyper-normalization documentary. Check this out, I'll be back in a minute. In the face of the horror and the growing chaos, President Reagan was forced to act. He announced that American Marines would come to Beirut to lead a peacekeeping force. Reagan insisted that the troops were neutral but President Assad was convinced that there was another reality. He saw the troops as part of the growing conspiracy between America and Israel to divide the Middle East into factions and destroy the power of the Arabs. Assad decided to get the Americans out of the Middle East. And to do this, he made an alliance with the new revolutionary force of Ayatollah Khomeini's Iran. And what Khomeini could bring to Assad was an extraordinary new weapon that he had just created. It was called the poor man's atomic bomb.
Ayatollah Khomeini had come to power two years before as the leader of the Iranian Revolution. But his hold on power was precarious. And Khomeini had developed a new idea of how to fight his enemies and defend the revolution. Khomeini told his followers that they could destroy themselves in order to save the revolution, providing that in the process they killed as many enemies around them as possible. This was completely new, because the Quran specifically prohibited suicide. In the past, you became a martyr on the battlefield because God chose the time and place of your death. But Khomeini changed this. He did it by going back to one of the central rituals of Shia Islam. Every year, Shiites march in a procession, mourning the sacrifice of their founder, Hussein. As they do, they whip themselves, symbolically re-enacting Hussein's suffering. Khomeini said that the ultimate act of penitence was not just to whip yourself, but to kill yourself, providing it was for the greater good of the revolution. Now again, this is malicious compliance on my behalf. I'm sourcing this from a documentary that was broadcast on the BBC by a renowned BBC journalist. I'm not getting this from any tinfoil hat dissidents. No, I'm getting it from, yes, the BBC. And this is the uh, official history, that when um, there was this reinterpretation of the Quran and it worked okay and you know for the Iranians they decided this would be part of the revolution and then later on this idea of um, you know killing yourself as a martyr right was then um, somehow managed to get to the other side I think it was basically from the Shia to the Sunni and then the Palestinians started doing it right so then of course it, the chickens came home to roost if we are to believe that the official story of 9-11 happened and then this came to Britain in the form of 7-7 and it's been done in many countries across Europe. Right. So we, no one kicked off, did we? No one in the UK kicked off. There was no riots about any of it. And then over a couple of decades of not kicking off, basically the, loot, the blue touch paper was lit and um, this is what happened. And, and then as a result of that, a new PSYOP happens. They then decide to um, say and fast track everyone into, you know, who was writing, everyone who was tweeting things, everyone who was reposting everything. So they say, right, these people are the enemy. These are the biggest enemy that we have in the country. Why they appear to be appeasing the people that we were told 20 years ago were the bogeyman. Now, of course, what's my attitude to all this? I'll tell you what my attitude to all, all of this is. I think the bad management of immigration in Europe is basically a problem and the government has not addressed it and actions are having consequences and as a result this is what appears to be happening. Now if I met someone who just got off a dinghy and, and I thought they were all right as an individual and I was talking to them and, um, and I didn't feel a threat from that person as an individual, I wouldn't judge them. You know that's the thing. I'd have the conversation with them, and if it turned out that they seemed to be quite awake to what was going on, my, my attitude would be that while you're here in the UK, I would say, if I was there and talking to them, that someone is shaking the jar. There are red ants and black ants in this jar. Remember, your conflict is not with the people here. My conflict is not with you. Neither of us are shaking the jar. That's what I would say, right? But at the same time, you can understand that a lot of uh, you know, how can I say that, that while we've been living in this post-woke world, while we've been having academia shove critical race theory, whoops, sorry I knocked the tripod there, yes, critical race theory, and a lot of what seems to be anti-white rhetoric that has been going on, a lot of people who are not far right, incidentally, have been um, noticing this. They've been noticing that uh, there's some kind of flippening from one side to the other seems to have happened, and that maybe we've been conditioned to believe Right, that the that far right fashion was was a bad thing now, in its real form it obviously still is, and I still believe it is too. But I also remember the old communists as well, the Reds they used to call them back then. I never trusted them either. I also remember the end of the Cold War too. You know when that happened in the late 80s and early 90s, 
when the BBC and all the newspapers and all the mainstream and all the government were telling us in that time that it was okay to be a political dissident. Remember that? It's funny how they were telling us it was okay to be a political dissident then, but now it's not, if you, especially if you're white, working class, and you question the narrative now, no, it's not. So, which official story, which official mainstream, which government sanctioned story do I um, agree with more? Well, I obviously agree with the one back then, that political dissidents of totalitarian regimes are heroes. But, um, and you know, I'm going with the story that, from the government, from the broadcast media that existed back then, when it told us that. We haven't had regime change since then, have we not? We still got the same royal family. We still got the same palace of Westminster, have we not? So as we haven't had regime change since then, then I have to assume that you were right about how important it is to be a political dissident in the time of tyranny and how important people power was because you told us back then. Have you changed your mind all of a sudden? <laughs> right? You see, this is another, another thing. It just bothers me. So now we have these news divide, well, new divides. Now, yes, there does appear in my humble observation to be a two-tier system in the UK. But I see a, a sort of three-tier caste thing that is happening at the moment. Tier, the bottom tier, right, is basically the English working class. You see, they can't get the English working class to fall for the bullshit that comes out of, you know, what I would call American Marxism, as I call it now. What comes out of American colleges and universities based on the old French postmodernism mixed with a little bit of uh, old Marxism and stuff like that. They can't get us to believe this stuff. It just doesn't wash. Right? That's the thing. Um, so, you know, all this stuff about um, critical race theory and how um, white people are inherently bad, were born bad, and all of that, and why, why black lives matter but white lives don't, all of this stuff, I mean, they can't get us to believe it. They also can't convince us that we're racist as we did grow up in the most multicultural part of the society. So, you know, we grew up alongside and um, it just so turns out that a lot of the settled ethnic minorities in the UK who grew up in working class environments have the same issue as a lot of the white people do. But of course, you know, they are oblivious to it. either that or they just want to be oblivious to it. Don't know which one, but you get mere drift, you see. And so, I see, yes, there's people at the bottom, the working class, now the new bogeyman, the, the, you know, the government have pretty much um, declared war on the existence of working class Brits now, and that's the thing. So they're, they're the bottom tier. Then, of course, there's another tier, which I will refer to as the, the, the client class of the establishment. And these are the people who, um, they're more likely to, well, how can I say? They're a certain demographic, let me see, let me say, right? They seem to have been new arrivals who have arrived in large numbers in more recent years. Um, they are not the same people as the original, now settled ethnic minorities. They are a different group of people. They basically are treated with kid gloves and, um, and they are treated with total political correctness, um, which is, seems to be going on right now. Uh, they are basically welcomed by the people at the top. Um, and these people I refer to as the client class are the people who seem to be able to get away with more than the working class can get away with. And there clearly does seem to be some sort of two-tier thing going on. Now my attitude is, I don't want to resent them myself. I don't want to stand in judgement of them as individuals. And if it was possible to find some of them who are of the more individualistic persuasion, and if it was possible to de-radicalise de them from any kind of what I would call Borg collective hive mind that they may have been radicalised by and actually talk to them and say, look, we're ants in a jar, someone else shook the jar, let's not buy into it, I'd rather us be friends. And if there's a way that we could do that, I would do that more than anything else. Because that would be better than just, you know, how can I say, being racist against them. But as crime goes up, um, violent crime goes up, violent crime that appears to be being ignored, and I know that correlation doesn't always um, you know, equal causation. And I know that, say for instance, a good example of that would be like, say for instance, over the same time period, the price of coffee went up at the same time that the wages of lorry drivers went down. There's not really any connection. That's just correlation and it would just be a coincidence. But 
When it comes to correlation and causation, there are loads of statistics that you can dig through to actually prove that there is not just correlation, but causation as well happening in the, since, uh, how can I say, 1997 and the doors were opened and immigration just went up tenfold, right? It can be argued that this has happened. It can also be argued that in the politically correct era and in the aftermath of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry or whatever, that they don't want to appear to be racist, the police, as they had been before, and they have been before, and you know, it was true. And so as a result of that, they um, have been put themselves in an awkward position of overcorrection, which means there's a lot they can't talk about. And because they're very heavily invested in a certain narrative and they can't budge from it for fear they might be losing face, they can't exactly get away with saying, look, we fucked up, we're wrong about bloody everything you were right, working class people, they ain't gonna do that. Well, it'd be so easy if they did, wouldn't it? <laughs> but they ain't going to do it, right? So we've ended up in a situation which is a bit of a problem. Now, as I say, if I met any of these individual immigrants, one by one by one, or I met two or three of them and they were nice to me, I'd be nice to them. You know, I would. What reason would I not have to be nice to them if they're nice to me first? Don't come into it, right? So that's the thing. <laughs> so, yes, we appear to be in a situation I'm calling them the client class, right? The client class of the elites, because I think they have a use for them. Because they can't find a use for the working class anymore because they can't get the working class to buy into the bullshit narrative. That's what it comes down to. And of course, tier three, the top. The chattering classes, the middle classes, the, the people who bought into all of the indoctrination of woke, the Islington set, the, uh, what was it, the, the people who, um, you know, uh, say refugees welcome here, the lefty types so, you know, who uh, live in a, a fantasy utopia because they're still affluent and they haven't quite noticed that it might affect them somewhere down the line. You know? They're the people who will say refugees welcome here out loud but in their heads they're thinking refugees welcome five miles down the road. Right? You know? And if you were to ask them um, do you want to house any of these uh, refugees that have just come straight off the boat? Well, they'd spit out their avocado on toast with vegan butter and they'd quaff their kombuchas all over their shirts. But that's okay, they've had those shirts now for more than five minutes so they can bring them to the charity shop um, so that people from a lower economic background um, than themselves can buy them for cheaper. And uh, how virtuous of them, hey? Eh? Uh, you know. Right, <laughs> so there you go. These people are living in a fantasy world. They haven't quite worked out yet that, of course, they will be affected by this as the economy will eventually squeeze them as it goes up and up and up and up. Uh, you know, they are still, they're basically playing the rules of the traitors and the grasses and the sellouts, right? While the working classes are, are the new oppressed group, um, the client class in the middle, who again caught up in this just as much as anyone else because their strings are being pulled by some other invisible hands as well um, have just come in and you know they, they take they bring their ways with them they get treated with kid gloves they don't really have any uh, incentive to do anything else and this mess is created that we find ourselves in and again I don't I don't sort of blame any of the I don't blame any of the pawns I blame the chess players right I don't blame any of the ants in the jar I blame the jar shaker because that's what it comes down to and one of the things I really would like to be able to do is to find individuals from all of the different groups and all of the different, um, you know, demographics and say, look, we all have to unite. We're all being played by the same people. And somehow that's where a people's movement comes from. You know, how can I say? People who you can rescue from the woke karate, people you can rescue from the immigrant class, class, whether they're legal or illegal, who think, hang on, yes, I understand now what we're being played. Again, working class people who are not stupid enough to smash everything up all the time, you know? There's plenty of people out there who could get together and form a new intellectual movement. And as a result, if we were able to be sophisticated, were able to create a movement, a talking shop, um, where we use the adversarial system in a crown courts with juries to actually speak out against the tyranny that is being brought in before it's too late. Could that be done? I would like to see it be done. In the meantime, I'm currently considering Elon Musk to be the official acting uh, leader of His Majesty's opposition, 
due to um, the way he's been recently behaving at the moment. And is he now going to be made an enemy of the state, you know, in, in the UK? I mean, this is the thing. Are all of the Labour government and all the police and all the people who are post and the Home Office in the UK are posting on X? Are, are you sort of indirectly complicit with an enemy of the state by using the facilities of your arch nemesis, you know? I mean, this is the thing. Are you going to have to arrest yourselves for that? What about me? I'm out here in the um, in the Philippines, and you know, like in order to be able to have the internet at all, I needed Starlink because there isn't the infrastructure out here. I mean, right? They have this thing called boxes, and the boxes are available for all the neighbours around this area, but none were available for me at the time when I first moved in. It's not like the UK in the sense that everyone had a landline in their house, and as a result, that old infrastructure was adapted for the modern internet, and everyone could, um, you know, have hardwire internet. I had no choice but to use Starlink. Right, so um, am I? Are you going to tell me that I'm? Uh, was it funding an enemy of the state by having to give money to Elon? Right? How many of you have got Teslas? Right? Are you or have bought Teslas? How many of you have actually, you know, con you know, contributed to anything in Elon Musk's economy? Are you in power now? Going to have to arrest yourselves for siding with an enemy of the state, uh, a right-wing uh, Nazi terrorist, as you like to call them? You know, if you all of you, the Home Office, the UK government, um, you know, every member of the Labour Party, every member of everyone who is, um, you know, saying that they don't like Elon Musk, right? While you're still on X, while you're still using it, while it still provides a gravy train for you to be on, shut up about Elon Musk until you remove yourselves from it. It's the old, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. In the meantime, you know, I'd like, I'd like, uh, I personally would like there to be uh, some kind of future miraculous mega bull run in investments that Elon Musk is holding on to in order to make him a trillionaire so he could afford to buy Britain. That'd be great. I'd, I'd, be, I'd be happy with that, you know. What's Britain worth uh, over two years? Six trillion, something like that? If Elon Musk could become a multi-trillionaire and then have enough money to just buy Britain, the, and he could buy it for the price of the, the GDP of two years, oh, that'd be cool. And he could rename it X-Land. That'd be cool. I'd like that. I'm sure a lot of people would actually like that at the moment, you know. That'd be, that'd be good, you know, because I think that the only thing, the only thing people that are going to save us at the moment are the rogue billionaires, like uh, Elon Musk or Donald Trump. Now, a lot of people won't agree with me there. And the only people, the only intellectuals who are going to be able to spread the real, true understanding of what's going on at the moment as we go into the future, the mega intellectuals, the very highly educated intellectuals that exist, people like Douglas Murray, a good example there, you know, then the, they're being turned into, he's been turned into a flipping dissident now. You yeah. know, it's ridiculous, isn't it? So, as I say, everyone, this is my advice to you just to sum up everything. Malicious compliance as a concept, you know, when people just say you can't comply your way out of tyranny, well, if you use malicious compliance, you source your things from things that they approve you source things from things that they approved 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago, and you, and you, you basically state your case that all of your apparent dissent as a dissident that you were using actually come from pre-narratives um, of previous versions of the same government and seen as we haven't had a regime change and you are, you have a pluralist mind. Well, the question therefore is, if your predecessors said it was all right, but now you don't say it was all right, did you overthrow your predecessor? Was there a coup between now and then? Did you arrest them for saying these things? Did you arrest the present party members uh, for going along with previous narratives that you no longer approve of? And if you didn't, well, how can you have anything against me? I complied to the best of my abilities and the best of my knowledge. I didn't incite hatred, I didn't incite violence. None of that stuff, no. I complied to you the rules of the adversarial system in all the time that I'd done this. And even when I quoted people who did pick holes in the propaganda, um, as you saw today, my best source of the day was a baroness in the House of Lords. So, you know, so, um, you know, and, you know, all the, all the bollocks about wanting to extradite people from all over the world to get them and put us in the prisons. Well, look, I haven't told anyone to riot. I'm not um, telling every, anyone to do anything irresponsible. Ultimately, I don't want these things to happen. But the bad management and the stupidity of this moronic, dunce, cacistocracy that seems to be existing at the moment, that seems to be spreading around the Western world, 
you basically are, you know, creating your own demise. And to, what do you expect if more riots happen? What do you expect if all this stuff, if there's more going to be more disorder? What do you expect if you lose control? What you can do, you can't just blame social media, blame people all the time. You've got, there's got to come a point where you have to look at yourselves and you have to introspect and you have to ask yourself the question, well, did I not read the room right? Is there anything I said or did that was wrong? You have to do that. You know, you can't just be blameless and act like, well, you know, because that's childish, that's stupid, that's just complete dunderheaded ignorance. You kind of got to be able to look at yourself and you've got to ask yourself, well, did I do anything wrong? We're all expected to do that, you know? We're all expected to, any decent person has got to stand aside and think, well, is there anything I did wrong? Can I look back on what I did? Can I look back on what I said and think, yeah, there was stuff that I did wrong and maybe I could put it right. And you know what? You'd win the hearts and minds of the people if you did it. Because people would think, well, that was good, you had the courage. You know, you had the courage, you weren't man enough to do so. And people would respect you more. And you'd win the hearts and minds. And, and then whatever power that you had, you'd be more likely to hold on to it. But there's just no point talking to these people, is there? There's no point talking to them. I think someone asked, what would you do, what would you say to Keir Starmer if you met him in a pub? And I said, well, I was thinking of saying, nothing, he wouldn't listen. I don't even think I'd bother to go near him, to be honest, you know? If I met Donald Trump, Nigel Farage and Elon Musk in a pub, I'd be straight over there and say, hello. Uh, I'd even flip him by him drinks. I mean, he might have more money than me, but I'd say, oh, can I buy you a round? I'd say to him, yeah, I would. And then I'd sit down and bang the world to rights with him. And you know what would be good? I think I'd be comfortable to tell them where I disagreed with them because I think they'd respect that, and I think, well, you know, and, they, and we'd have a conversation about it. Not with Keir Starmer, though, no. <laughs> He'd probably say to me that your opinions are illegal, and um, you must go to one of my mates, one of my cronies, with a wig, you know? That's what I reckon he'd say. Anyway, enough of my yant uh, yanting. I meant, enough of my ranting and yakking. Yanting and racking? <laughs> God. I wouldn't put it past them to make spoonerism a crime, too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, enough of me. See you later, alligator. See you soon, baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.